the stir and repr functions are useful just by themselves. But they're also an interesting example of what's called a polymorphic function. So polymorphic functions are functions that apply to many different forms of data. So stir and repr are polymorphic because you can pass in any kind of object you want, and they're always just supposed to do the right thing with any argument. So the way this actually happens mechanically is that repr invokes a zero argument method called underscore underscore repr on its argument. And that way, it defers to the argument to figure out how to generate a repr string. So we can see this behavior in action just by explicitly invoking this same method on a date. And it will give me the repr string. So the repr function doesn't have a lot of functionality at all. It just asks the object that was passed in, how do you represent yourself? Sir similarly invokes a zero argument method called stir on its argument. And that will give back the stir string. So in this way, even though stir and repr functions were created before your user defined class was created, you can still have your user defined class work with them just by defining these methods. So let's talk about implementing repr and stir strings. Actually, the behavior of repr is slightly more complicated than I suggested when I said it just invokes repr on its argument. It has a few rules. An instance attribute called repr is ignored. Only class attributes are used to generate repr strings. And this is just a quirk of how repr was defined in the first place. We need to figure out how we would implement this behavior as well. And what about strings? Well, strings are also complicated. For the same reason, instance attributes are ignored. But if there's no stir attribute, then it just uses the repr string. So if you're going to define one or the other of repr or stir, just define repr, and stir will be using that implementation as well. And it's interesting to think about how we would implement that behavior. By the way, stir is a constructor for a class, the class of strings. And so it's not technically a function, it's a class. OK, let's see if we can understand the implications of all these things I've said. So let's create a class for ourselves that we'll call bear. And in the bear class, we're going to define a repr method which takes no arguments except for the bear itself. And it's going to return a string that evaluates to a bear. If I create a bear at this point, you see it's printed out as a bear, as opposed to something else. And that's because for this bear, there is a repr method that, when invoked, gives me back the bear string. And so when I look at OSCII, I see the bear. OK, so to explore this more deeply, let's define a function called printBear. And what it's going to do is define OSCII as a bear, and then print lots of different things, such as the repr string of OSCII. Well, why don't we just print out OSCII as well? Let's um, print out the stir string of OSCII. Let's print out what we get when we invoke repr on OSCII. And let's print out what we get when we invoke stir on OSCII. Now, I told you at some point that both of these are the same. So let's put them next to each other. Repr is a little bit different. And these two are more or less the same, but we'll find some differences eventually. OK, so if I print out a bear, what do I get? Well, five different versions of the same thing. And why is that? Well, that's because we've defined a repr string. Stir just uses repr if it's not there, etc. But if I define my own stir string that just returns a human readable version, and then I run print bear again, I'll see some differences. 
So if I print out OSCII, I'll just see the stir string, which is human readable. But if the repr string or the repr method are invoked, then I get bare. OK, based on everything I've told you, I'll give you one more challenge, which is what happens when I create an init function and we set a repr instance method that just returns OSCII and a stir instance method which returns this bare instance. OK, a challenge to you. What are the five lines that will be printed out when I run print bare at this point? So print OSCII and print stir OSCII really do always do the same thing. They give you this stir string, which is a bear. Both of these ignore the instance attribute, this bear instance. The repr string ignores the OSCII repr instance attribute, goes straight to the class, calls that, and prints out bear. Whereas invoking repr and stir always find the instance attribute before the class. So that's why we see OSCII and this bear instance. So you can see that while there are slight differences between what repr does and what invoking the underscore underscore repr method do, um, we can characterize them through this example. One always looks up the instance method first, and one goes straight to the class. OK, challenge number two. How would I define the repr function? It takes in some argument x. It doesn't just invoke repr on it, because it has to skip the instance attribute. We can do that by getting the class of x using the type function. But then we have to pass in x explicitly as the argument, because when you look up a method name on a class, you don't get a bound method. You just get a regular function. OK, how would we define stir? Well, that just depends. First thing we need to do is get the type of x, and then see if there's an attribute on that type called stir. If so, then we just return. Oh, we need to return here. Just if so, then we just return what we get by invoking the stir method on x. Otherwise, we just return the repr of x. So it should be the case that if I print bear again using my custom implementations of repr and stir, I'll get the same behavior as I did before. And so it is. So if you want to know what repr and stir built-in functions do, you can look at these implementations to see their special quirks. This idea that a function can defer to its argument in order to implement very general behavior is an exciting and powerful one. And really, it's enabled by message passing, or this idea that objects can interact with each other by looking up attributes on each other. And the attribute lookup rules allow different data types to respond to the same message. So lots of different classes can all have a repr method, and therefore, they can all behave in some similar way. So a shared message, an attribute name, that elicits the similar behavior from different object classes is a powerful method of abstraction called an interface. So an interface is a set of shared messages along with some specification of what they mean. For example, the underscore underscore repr and underscore underscore stir methods are always supposed to mean the same thing for every class including the ones that are built in and the ones that you create on your own. They're supposed to return Python and human readable string representations of the objects on which they're invoked. Now, some programming languages have interfaces as first class objects. That's not true in Python. Instead, you implement an interface just by adding the attributes that you need in order to make your class behave in the way that you want it to behave. 